Hello everyone, welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is the part 7 of the Hemolytic Anemia series and in this part I am going to discuss about paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. That's in short it is referred to as PNH. Now let's get back to the classification of hemolytic anemias which I have been talking in the last 6 parts we have discussed you know all the hereditary hemolytic anemias. So in this part I am going to talk about one of the important acquired hemolytic anemias that is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria which is abnormalities of the red cell membrane. The learning objectives for today's session will be you know you will know how to define PNH, you will understand the pathogenesis of uh, PNH, we will list out various clinical features of PNH and then you know understand the various laboratory diagnostic aspects of PNH and finally a point about a treatment of PNH. Now what is PNH? Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria is a disease of hematopoietic stem cell. Now this is the only hemolytic anemia with acquired mutation in the hematopoietic stem cell. Now let us understand the hematopoiesis in general. So we know that hematopoietic stem cells, okay, they differentiate into various progenitor cells which have the self-renewal capacity and they can differentiate into the myeloid lineage and the lymphoid lineage. The myeloid lineage can further, you know, give rise to erythrocytes, granulocytes, megakaryocytes, monocytes, whereas the lymphoid lineage can give rise to B lineage cells, T cells and NK cells. Okay. Now you know that the PNH is the disease of hematopoietic stem cell, isn't it? Where one or several hematopoietic stem cells acquire a somatic mutation of PIGA gene. Okay. Now, once there is a mutation in this PIGA gene and that cell which has acquired this mutation, they undergo clonal expansion. Okay. They are non-malignant clonal expansion which is what we refer to as PNH or paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria which is nothing but the clinical manifestation of the disease. Now, let us understand what this PIGA gene is. Phosphatidyl inositol glycan class A gene is located on the short arm of the human X chromosome. Okay, it provides instructions for making a protein called phosphatidyl inositol glycan class A. It's nothing but a PIGA protein. Okay, now what does this do? This protein takes part in series of steps that produce a molecule called GPI anchor. Okay, and GPI anchor basically anchors more than different proteins, 20 different proteins of diverse function which are normally expressed on various hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, so it basically sorts of anchors different proteins to an underlying cell. Now imagine that this is a cell membrane and these are the anchor proteins. Okay, these are GPI anchor or a glycophosphatidyl ionositol anchor. Okay, and those are the proteins which attaches to these anchors. Now we are interested in two important proteins which are relevant for today's topic and these proteins are CD59 and CD55. CD59 is also referred to as membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis, whereas CD55 is a decay accelerating factor. What are these? These are complement regulatory proteins. Now, how do they regulate? CD55 prevents the formation of C3 convertase, whereas CD59, it blocks the C5B9 complex or nothing but the membrane attack complex. It is this membrane attack complex which attacks the cell membranes and then makes pores on those cell membranes and then the cell dies. So basically these proteins that is CD59 and CD55 they prevent the damage to any of these cells by the products of these complement pathways. So now we need to understand that deficiency of these two proteins accounts for the complement mediated intravascular hemolysis okay and that is a primary manifestation of this particular disease. Now we know that there is a PIGA gene on chromosome number 10 Whenever there is a somatic mutation in the hematopoietic stem cells, what happens? There will be deficient <coughs> or absent GPA anchor proteins. So now we know that whenever there is a deficiency or absence of these anchor proteins, even though if you have these CD59 and 55 in circulation, they are not of use. So for these cells, these proteins that is CD59 and CD55, they are deficient. That means to say that these complement regulatory proteins, they are not linked to the cell membrane and these cells are susceptible to lysis by the complement. So as I told you, somatic mutations of the PIGA occur in hematopoietic stem cells. When I say hematopoietic stem cells, all the cell lineages are involved, whether it is erythroid, myeloid or megakaryocytic, all lineages are involved. 
okay but then for some reasons rbcs are predominantly affected the wbcs are not much affected the thrombocytes are not much affected basically because they might have some other proteins or some other factors which are which makes them resistant to these complement products okay but then these enucleated cells are the rbcs are the ones which are most commonly or predominantly affected by this piga gene mutation so as i said the mutation can occur in one hematopoietic stem cells or few hematopoietic stem cells or most hematopoietic stem cells okay based on the number of hematopoietic stem cells involved even in the circulation typically you can have normal cells and pnh blood cells okay these two coexist in the patients with pnh so these cells can be small percentage in some cases or it can be more than 90% in some cases okay so based on the percentage of cells a uh, percentage of these pnh cells there is wide variations in symptoms that is what we need to understand the symptomatology depends upon the percentage of pnh cells in the circulation okay now by now you would have understood that the etiopathogenesis of pnh is much simpler it's basically a sensitivity to complement mediated lysis isn't it that sensitivity is because of deficiency of cd59 and cd55 and that deficiency is because of deficiency of these anchor proteins or gpi anchor proteins now look at this that is a normal red blood cell okay with a gpi anchor and of course you can uh, expect that cd59 cd55 can easily attach to these gpi anchors and these are normal erythrocytes and absolutely no hemolysis what is this this is an rbc which do not have a gpi anchor and that's why it is referred to as a pnh erythrocyte we all should understand that under physiologic conditions the alternate pathway of complement is in a state of continuous low grade activation that will be activated throughout the day 24 bar 7 normal erythrocytes which have a protective proteins they are not hemolyzed and that's why they survive their complete life span now whereas pnh erythrocytes which have deficiency in these anchor proteins okay and thereby you don't have these complement regulatory proteins that means to say that they will have chronic spontaneous hemolysis it is said that the life span of rbcs in pnh is around 6 days now let us understand the terminology paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria why is the word nocturnal used okay so uh, during night you know during sleep it is said that there is some amount of hyperventilation which results in retention of carbon dioxide some amount of carbon dioxide and that can lead to mild respiratory acidosis which can activate complement and because you have activated uh, complement pathway you can find these complement products particularly the membrane attack complex and now that you know that you have pnh cells which are sensitive to these complement products because they are not protected by those proteins so they undergo hemolysis okay so earlier it was thought that this happens only during night but then this theory is now disproved hemolysis can occur throughout the day because we know that the complement pathway particularly the alternate complement pathway is always under activation though it is a low grade activation okay so it is not only nocturnal hmm? but then you can have episodes of symptoms there can be paroxysms of symptoms which can be precipitated by various infections it can be precipitated by some drugs you know or can be trauma but sometimes it can be spontaneous without any precipitating factors that's why it is called paroxysmal okay paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria the hemoglobinuria part we will understand it a bit later okay now when intravascular hemolysis occurs at night what happens hemoglobin accumulates in the bladder okay all the hemoglobin which is filtered through the renal uh, tubular epithelial cells they accumulate in the bladder isn't it okay this particular uh, urine in the bladder okay if the urine is acidic the hemoglobin in acidic urine can gets converted into acid hematin and that's how the color changes so once these things happen the following morning you know these patients you know they are so shocked to see this startlingly abnormal appearance of the first voided urine and this is hemoglobinuria which is painless and the color ranges from red to brown to even black depending upon the content of hemoglobin and then the content of acid hematin formation now what are the features of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria classical cases in classical pnh cases there will be macroscopic hemoglobinuria but unfortunately these classical cases accounts to only 25% of cases okay Usually PNH appears in around fourth to fifth decades of life and persists for life. So we mentioned that there will be episodic hemolysis, and that episodic hemolysis means 
There will be episodes of macroscopic hemoglobinuria usually occurring in association with various infections or unusual stress such as trauma or surgery. Now what happens in the remaining 75% of cases? Okay, These patients manifest with non-specific symptoms like lethargy, malaise and weakness. Okay, They can also have various kinds of abdominal pain, backache and headaches. The most important feature in PNH is the thromboembolic complications. Still there is no proper explanation as to why the thrombosis occurs in these patients. Okay, but then thrombosis do occur. They have a very striking predisposition towards the intravascular thrombosis, particularly the venous circulation. The most common veins involved are the intra-abdominal veins. Okay, the other veins which can be involved are the hepatic veins, the cerebral veins, and the subdermal veins. Depending upon the involvement of these veins, patients manifest with various symptoms. Like for example, if there is an intra-abdominal vein involvement, okay, these patients manifest with abdominal pain. If there is an hepatic vein involvement, you can have hypochondriac pain. If there is a cerebral uh, venous involvement, you can have patients can manifest with headaches. Subdermal vein involvement, patients manifest with various tender nodules all over uh, the body. So that is the reason why thrombosis is a very bad prognostic sign. And you should remember that this is the most common cause of death in PNH. Apart from these thromboembolic complications, you can have various renal abnormalities as well. We know that you know, lots and lots of hemoglobin is being shed in urine. Okay, When the hemoglobin is broken down, that releases lots of iron okay and that is being absorbed or reabsorbed by the tubular epithelial cells and these tubular epithelial cells store or sort of you know have lots and lots of hemosiderin okay and you know that anything which is in excess can damage these cell and that is the reason why these patients can manifest with various forms of renal insufficiency which can be acute or chronic sometimes these patients also manifest with uh, vague symptoms like dysphagia it is thought that dysphagia is basically because of nitric oxide deficiency now what happens here is that the free hemoglobin sort of utilizes the nitric oxide within the body and nitric oxide you should understand that this is very important for functioning of these smooth muscles so the patients might have difficulty in swallowing sometimes it can be very painful that that's the reason why it is referred to as dysphagia now those were the clinical manifestations now let us understand the various lab findings in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria the most important findings in the blood is these patients manifest with anemia okay this is an hemolytic anemia right to begin with anemias can be macrocytic okay over a period of time when there is a lot of uh, hemoglobin being released into circulation and then there is a lot of loss of iron and that might lead to secondary iron deficiency and then these can manifest with microcytic blood picture as well there will be moderate amount of anisopoikilocytosis there will be polychromatophilia in the initial phases that's because the bone marrow is trying to compensate for the loss of these blood cells right so you can have some amount of nucleated rbcs as well so there can be leukopenia and thrombocytopenia so the leukopenia and thrombocytopenia is not because of destruction of these leukocytes and thrombocytes by the complements, it's basically because of bone marrow destruction rather than complement mediated destruction. You should also note that neutrophil alkaline phosphatase, that's another uh, GPI associated protein. Okay, so that will be low or absent. The only other condition where neutrophil alkaline phosphatase is low is chronic myeloid leukemia that you need to remember. So as I told you, there will be moderate amount of anisopoikilocytosis. That means variation in size and shape of the RBCs. Some can be macrocytes in the later stages can be microcytes. Sometimes you can find schistocytes. There are large cells which can be polychromatophilic cells. Coming to the bone marrow. In the initial stages, you can have normoblastic hyperplasia because, you know, the bone marrow is trying to compensate for the loss of these RBCs. Okay, so that is the hemolytic phase. Later, there can be decreased megakaryocytes or even hypoplastic marrow when that is referred to as aplastic phase. Okay, so what was hyperplastic bone marrow in the beginning can finally lead to an aplastic bone marrow resulting in thrombocytopenia, anemia and leukopenia that is nothing but the pancytopenia. Another important uh, component of lab finding is the urine examination. So the urine might show increased amounts of urobilinogen, hemoglobinuria you all know that. Okay, when the hemoglobin is broken down, it can be hemosiderinuria. So as you all know, the early morning urine will always be dark in color okay it can be red to brown to black but most commonly it is coca colored most often this hemoglobinuria okay is often confused as hematuria and as the day progress you know the urine tends to become normal in appearance okay it becomes it assumes its straw or pale yellow color in the later part of the day now how do you diagnose pnh 
So pain, is, you cannot diagnose pain as based on peripheral findings alone. You have to demonstrate that there is loss of these proteins. How do you do that? It is done by flow cytometry. So basically flow cytometry is a technique where you measure the percentage of cells which are deficient in these GPI anchored proteins. Okay. You estimate the number of cells which have attached CD59 or CD55. That's how you measure if the cells are deficient in these two proteins. That means to say that these patients have GPI anchor deficiency, which is because of PIGA gene mutation. So there's another test called HAM test. Okay. This was devised by Thomas Hale Ham in the year 1937. He was a physician. He exposed these RBCs to the serum which is acidified. Once these PNH RBCs are exposed to the serum which is acidified, they are lysed. I mean the RBCs are lysed because of complement and this is also known as acidified serum lysis test. But the drawback of this particular test is that this is having a very low sensitivity and low specificity as well. So that's the reason why this test is obsolete now. Okay, you, 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 you diagnose PNH based on the flow cytometric findings and the estimation of the levels of CD uh, 59 and 55 containing cells. So other investigations which you can consider in PNH is the plasma and serum findings basically to demonstrate the evidence of intravascular hemolysis. Now how do you demonstrate that? One, there can be increased levels of unconjugated bilirubin, there can be increased levels of free hemoglobin and methemoglobin. And because of methemoglobin increase, the plasma can assume golden brown color. Another important uh, investigation you can consider is the serum haptoglobin concentration is low or even absent. The what is this haptoglobin? Haptoglobin is a protein which is produced by the liver that the body uses to clear free hemoglobin. You know that in PNH, you have lots and lots of free hemoglobin and the haptoglobin is utilized. So that is the reason why serum haptoglobin is low or even absent. Now LDH concentration, another in, in, uh, important investigation you should consider is LDH, lactate dehydrogenase and the concentration of lactate dehydrogenase is markedly elevated. That's because you know that the lactate dehydrogenase is an enzyme which is present in all cells including RBCs. So whenever there is a destruction of RBCs, the lactate dehydrogenase which is present inside the cell comes out and is found in the serum which can be estimated as very high levels of LDH. So basically elevation in lactate dehydrogenase reflects that there is some amount of hemolysis going on. So after knowing the lab diagnosis, so let us see uh, what is the treatment of PNH. We know that this is an acquired disease, right? So is there a treatment? Yes, there is a treatment. The most ideal treatment would be stem cell transplantation. Replace all those uh, mutated cells by stem cell transplantation. But unfortunately, this is not that easy. It's not realistic. Okay. This kind of uh, treatment uh, is considered when the PNH is usually life-threatening. Okay. So what, what are the other modalities of treatment? So you can have antibodies that target the C5 complement component. That means you prevent the RBCs from getting exposed to these complement products. Okay. I know that this does not alter the underlying defect of PNH, but then it can prevent RBCs getting exposed to these products, right? So there are two monoclonal antibodies which are used. One is Ecolizumab and Raulizumab. Even this treatment has limited uh, success. So other modalities of treatment could be, you know, supportive treatment for uh, anemia. If there is iron deficiency, supplement with, uh, you know, iron, you can think of treating the thrombotic complications you have to treat infections if it is there so all supportive management can be done depending upon the symptomatology so that completes the topic thank you for watching if you have liked this video please hit the like button do comment don't forget to subscribe you know in the next tutorial i'll be discussing another important hemolytic anemia that is acquired hemolytic anemia again we will discuss immune hemolytic anemias stay tuned if you have liked this video do share thank you